Welcome to the Dreams Are Real podcast, where we aim to ignite the fire that allows you to unleash your greatest potential. I'm your host, Dan McPherson, and I'm on a mission to help you own your story on the way to building your ideal life. The first step toward achieving your dreams is to overcome the momentum of zero. Take a step and let that motion dispel the emotions of fear, worry, or self-doubt. No matter where you are in your life or career, only you can make that choice. The good news, you've got this. Why? Because dreams are real. Let's dive in. Welcome to the Dreams Are Real podcast. I'm your host, Dan McPherson, and we have another fantastic guest with us today, a gentleman that I've known, but only online. I've known him for a little bit over a year. He is the executive director of Open Roads Media. He is the host and producer of the Latitude Adjustment podcast. He also has this, one of the most fascinating I guess, views of life and approaches to the world that I've seen. He truly is finding a way to make peace in his own way in the world. I look forward to being able to share his story with you today. Welcome to the podcast, Eric Maddox. Thanks, man. And I don't know, I'd say you stuck that landing. (laughs) That was a pretty solid intro. I appreciate that for sure. Uh, I am glad to have you here. And, I, and I, I think our audience is going to be fascinated and truly drawn into the world of what you do. And to give them a start at that, I have to ask, when other people, when other people look at you and say, what do you do? How do you respond? Yeah, I mean, I've been trying mulling that one over. And I mean, maybe it's fitting that I'm struggling to answer that question <laughs> because I struggle very <laughs> often to to answer when, uh, when other people ask it. Um, you know, some of that's contextual, but I mean, I, I know that labels are useful, but I find it hard to find one that fits. And I, I am wearing a few different hats, so that also kind of complicates things. But uh, I, I just say that I got my, like a lot of irons in the fire, and uh, I'm trying to figure out a way to make the things that I, that I love pursuing uh, uh, sustainable, so, you know, so that I can survive doing them. But so what are the things you love pursuing? Maybe start, maybe start going down that path. What do you love pursuing? I, mean, I like connecting people. I love connecting people. And I, and I, and I think that I really believe in the, in the power of curiosity and that if people are challenged and, and rise up to the challenge to remain curious, uh, when we're really constantly bombarded by this pressure to assert certainty and not to admit fault, not to admit that we're confused, not to admit that we're ignorant. And I think that there's kind of this all out assault on being open-minded <laughs> in a sense. And that's kind of what I'm pushing for. And, and I guess in my podcast, as well as in my nonprofit work is really to just undermine the notion that certainty is something that can be easily apprehended. Give us an example of something that you, you have this all, all out assault on it, uh, to, to get people to be open-minded. I love that. What, what's an example of a particular area that you might work on? I think a big one, I mean, it's context is helpful, but so, I mean, to speak in kind of in an abstract sense, I'd say that, uh, where I see that assault on critical thinking and um, uh, skepticism coming from most often is from our leadership and from traditional media, right? So if there's a challenge that I put to people, it's to question uh, the dominant narrative, especially when it's very simplistic and antagonistic uh, towards those whom you haven't had any direct experience, you know? Um, and question when you're told to fear rather than trust. Is there a particular area where you feel like you've seen movement or where you feel like there's a larger need than others or a particular issue or a particular, a particular group that you've been able to make progress with? Yeah, that's, that's tricky, man. Cause I mean, so the, the stuff that I'm working on, these are like large societal scale issues <laughs> so, and I'm like s- some guy with like no funding and um, maybe some some uh, 
unreasonable expectations. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I think that there's something to be said for being unreasonable um, as long as you're not arrogant in, in uh, the pursuit of unreasonable goals. You know, that like, what is it that you're being unreasonable about? Is it in the service of something bigger than yourself and other people? Uh, where have I seen movement? I mean, honestly, in myself, first and foremost, I, I've, I've learned a lot from uh, placing myself in contexts where my presuppositions were false, you know, and, and the need to be able to adapt quickly and to take on board multiple viewpoints and be comfortable with uh, ambiguity to some degree. Can you share one of those situations maybe? What's that? Can you maybe share one of those situations? Um, I mean, let me me think. I'd say that that's kind of the story of my life, man. Okay. (laughs) Well, well then let's, let's talk about that. And I I can, I can give you an, an, an example, but, but that really is like, that's, that's my journey. Right. And I think that that's probably why it's, informs what I do. You know, there's not a huge separation between the, the, my life trajectory and um, the, the path that I'm trying to invite others to come on as well. Like, that's all. It's not that I'm some guy who's arrived at being enlightened or that I've got all the answers. It's more <laughs> that there's been things that I've learned along the way or certain ways of being uncomfortable or confused in the world that I've actually found to be rewarding and helpful that I'm trying to share with other people. And as often as not, I'm learning from the people who are involved in the projects with me as much as I might be teaching them something. So where I've learned, I mean, I grew up in a, what's kind of known as California's deep South, like Kern County, California, which is reliably like red district, uh, guns, football, Christian evangelical uh, um, community with lots of oil and uh, conservative views on the world. And that more or less informed my worldview uh, until I left the state, started studying philosophy, and then ultimately found myself in the Middle East um, as somebody who was very certain of the worldview that I kind of been raised in. And uh, that knocked me back quite a few steps, you know? (laughs) Like traveling around the Middle East and actually having people confront my presuppositions with like their lived experience and also just looking around, you know, um, it's, it's harder to be myopic and, uh, and to receive information passively and to just take people's word for it when you're actually immersed in a different country, in a different part of the world, in a different cultural context. When you switch to the, to the Middle East, what you say there is this totally different perspective. What were some of the biggest challenges to your worldview what were some of the biggest things that you looked and said man this this just this thing that i thought wasn't true i mean i think that this part maybe isn't so complicated because i suspect a a lot of your guests like just assuming that they're american like a lot of americans will relate to just having this kind of simplistic view of the middle east first of all that it's like the middle east that it's one place (laughs) and not like many different countries with their own unique histories cultures and uh um, and issues. So that was the first realization. Wow, this is actually a diverse part of the world and it's complicated. Second of all, just going there with my, what I've now learned to define as orientalist points of view, like kind of looking at that part of the world through the frame of Western colonial history and not the history or the identities that people would assign to themselves um, or their views on their own history. And just started realizing I'm talking to people that are highly educated and they have a very different view of history than the one that I've been raised with. They have a different view of America's role in their countries and in their region and in their lives than I was raised with. And they can articulate it clearly. They can defend it. They can critique my point of view in ways that I'm not able to really respond to capably. And that was just my first trip to the Middle East. That was 2002. So to put that in some context, that's I went there a year after September 11th happened and almost a decade before the Arab Spring happened. So it was an interesting moment. <laughs> but uh, from that, yeah, I just learned I have more to learn. That was really what I, my, pers- <laughs> my first take-home lesson was. I need to read some more books, and I want more of what I'm getting here because it just blew the doors off of everything that I, I don't know, been programmed to believe about the world. You know, you could probably experience that traveling in Latin America or 
sub-Saharan Africa or East Asia, probably a lot of different places. But for me, that place is the Middle East. Sounds like it changed your entire worldview and broadened a lot of horizons. Before that occurred, when you were younger, what was your dream? What, what did you think, I, I'm going to do this in the world, before, maybe before your eyes were opened a little more? Well, I mean, my first real ambition when I was a little kid was I wanted to be an astronaut. Nice. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, just, just, I, I went big when I was five. <laughs> and then I realized somewhere down the line that you had to be really good at math. And I wasn't so into putting in the work. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, so I just migrated my ambitions elsewhere. Um, I don't know. I don't know, aside from that whole astronaut thing, if I've had too many moments in my life where I was like, this is the job title that I want. It's been more about these are the set of experiences that I want next. These are the questions that are bothering me. Um, how can I find out more? Like, and, and not necessarily just like questions that can be answered from the standpoint of like research in a library, you know, like what can I learn about myself next? Um, and then finding ways to test myself or to test my assumptions or to, yeah, uh, sometimes it wasn't even a whole lot of thought put into it. It's just like, well, what's given all of the, there was a certain allure to going to the Middle East, it'll be honest, it wasn't coming from a humanitarian place or um, a place of empathy or altruism. It was that part of the world is supposed to be pretty messed up and violent. Um, and as like a 24 year old guy, I was like, yeah, well, uh, I want to see if I'm brave enough to go and live in a place full of extremists. You know, it, it wasn't necessarily a very thoughtful place that I was coming from. And uh, I went there with a lot of prejudices. And it wasn't really about wanting necessarily to, just, to learn about the people and the culture. It was kind of more about me. And it was after I got there that I was like, okay. Um, and I mean, this is going to sound super arrogant, but I was arrogant in that moment. I, that was, my realization was these people are smart. <laughs> and uh, I thought that uh, I'd have all the answers. You know, I mean, as, as ridiculous as that might sound, that's just kind of where I was at, at least on a subconscious level. And when I started realizing uh, a lot of these people are a lot smarter than me. And, uh, and I don't know anything about my own history or politics. Like they're lecturing me on what's going on in my own political system in my own country. I mean, before we even get to like talking about their history of which I know nothing. So, so it was, it was, it was humbling, but um, yeah, to, to your question about like, what have I selected? It's just uh, looking back now with the benefit of hindsight, I would say that it's pro it's been not so much about pursuing job titles. It's been more about pursuing experiences and curiosity. And as you think about those experiences, having had your eyes open, how did you respond? Um, I, I mean, again, that's kind of contextual too, but speaking generally, I'd say that uh, I wasn't an easy convert. So, and, and some of that I think has served me well which might sound a little bit strange, like why would being stubborn and resistant to change be beneficial? Because the opinions that I've come to at this stage in my life, and I'm not saying that they're set in stone and that, that I've got all the answers, but like where I'm at was hard won. You know, it was a long, like bumpy and like, uh, um, what would I call it? Not smooth, not friction free journey to where I'm at as far as my upbringing and having maybe a more like, I don't know, I don't really want to put myself someplace on the political spectrum, but, but I would definitely be characterized as leaning more to the left. And uh, I'm an atheist. You know, I'm, not, I'm no longer like the Christian evangelical kid that I was raised as. So I resisted those changes all along the way. Some of them are more recent than, than some so recent that it might surprise some people, you know, and because of that, because I, I would argue with people um, and, and demand that, uh, that they defend their position with facts and not emotions. When I was, when I came around to changing my mind or changing my point of view, it was usually like there was some substance behind it. You know, it wasn't just because I felt bad for some people and, and, and uh, made an emotional decision. It was, no, the weight of the facts seems to be on 
me needing to change my position here, <laughs> you know? Yeah, that, that had to be pretty powerful. And, and you said the first, the, you, your first views were hard won. The, the movement had to be even more hard won. A little, did you find it more like eroding rocks slowly changing over time? Or did you find it more like, uh, like a rock breaking as the right substance hit it? And, and you, you learned something new and, and the light shone down and you said, okay, it's, it's been a while, but boom, there it is. So is it more gradual or more you found a fact? Uh, I was... My point of view growing up as an evangelical Christian in a conservative part of the United States was more or less, and I don't know how political your listeners are, how familiar they are with the politics and ideologies of the region, but I was essentially a Christian Zionist. You know, I was raised to be very supportive of Israel no matter what um, their uh, behavior was like, and I'm speaking as like their politics. Right. right. Um, and I didn't know even what a Palestinian was until I was in college, which is a little bit weird given how adamantly I supported Israel. Like, how can you not even know the identity of the, <laughs> their, their quote-unquote adversaries in that conflict? Um, and yeah, so when I went to the Middle East, started talking to Arabs and Muslims, um, I started getting a different perspective. And then ultimately I went to the West Bank in Israel and lived there for five months as a graduate student studying international conflict transformation. And I interviewed people on both sides, collecting oral histories from Israelis and Palestinians about their experience having gone through the 1948 war. I interviewed former commandos uh, on the Israeli side. Was that dangerous? a lot of refugees on the Palestinian side. Sorry? Was that dangerous? No. No? No. Not remotely. Um, and I mean, and that's also one of the things that I would like to point out, you know, in this conversation is that uh, I think people very frequently ask me that question. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I've been in some situations that weren't maybe particularly safe looking back on them or even in the moment, but overwhelmingly, most of my experience in the Middle East has been, been no issues. And I think that one of my frustrations, for example, with like some foreign journalists um, or just people who have spent time in the Middle East, is that they'll either encourage or by omission um, allow people to assume that they're somehow ridiculously brave because of where they went. And that just ends up feeding the stigmas about the region, and it's unfair and inaccurate. I'm not a particularly brave person, and I've rarely been called to be in my time in the Middle East. And I want to make that very clear to your listeners that, like, don't buy the hype. Um, there's plenty of people who like, like a pat on the back. And so they won't say anything when you assume that they've seen a lot and had to be really brave. And I mean, I'm not taking anything away from war correspondents and aid workers who do put themselves in harm's way, you know, but that just having gone to the Middle East doesn't mean that you've been traumatized or that you've seen something terrible or that you've been faced with constant threats to your safety or that you had to be quote unquote vigilant. I lived in the West Bank for five months. I don't think I looked over my shoulder one time walking by myself at night to and from a refugee camp that I lived in. I can't say the same thing about living in mid-sized towns in the United States. <laughs> you know, I really can't. And I'm not exaggerating for effect. It's absolutely true. I could leave my laptop at a corner cafe in the West Bank, walk around the corner and come back and it would be there. Because the way that community functions there, you know, like people just wouldn't take it. It's just not going to happen. Um, so I didn't need to, it, it wasn't unsafe to go around doing those interviews when I was there. And for the most part, being in the Middle East with maybe a few exceptions where I kind of was taking calculated risks that I knew about, you know, like you can go to the wrong side of town anywhere in the U S too, and know right. that you're doing it. Right. It was like that. Um, that sure, you know, but the scariest place I've ever been in my life is a five minute walk from the U S Mexico border. It's what is Mexico, you know? Um, not the Middle East. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, I, and, but to get back to your original question about like how my mind was changed, things like that, um, I saw what I saw. I just saw the reality of people living under uh, what's now over 50 year military occupation in the West Bank. And the explanations that are offered in Western media and traditionally by American politicians by Israel as a state, um, just didn't hold water anymore when I actually saw what was happening on the ground. When I saw how people's land was being taken away, how they were being abused, how one set of laws 
um, were being applied to one group of people based on their religion or ethnic identity or nationality and a completely set different justice system for other people living literally across the street from each other. No borders, nothing. Just based on their identity um, and how they were being harassed and having their land taken away, kids getting thrown in prison, kids shot in the legs. These aren't like me just reciting news headlines I've read. I've been to a hospital, seen kids who were shot in the legs um, for throwing stones. Um, so at a certain point, you just have to ask yourself, like, um, if you can remain passive when you've seen things that contradict the dominant narrative. And then you weigh what the consequences are, too. You know, the, the propaganda machine on the Israeli side is extremely effective, and pretty much anybody who criticizes what's happening in that, that with regards to that conflict or criticizes Israel's behavior is just labeled an anti Semite. And I'm not, <laughs> you know, but. Uh, but um, that's a, a label that terrifies a lot of people, terrifies a lot of politicians. Um, it scares money away from political campaigns, and it's been very effective at uh, corralling people into supporting uh, what are really indefensible uh, policies on the part of Israel. So, yeah, I mean, I can go into the weeds with the policy <laughs> stuff, but that's not why we're here today. But that's one issue where my mind was changed by just being there, seeing things myself. And as you did that, it sounds like the the dream of what you may have looking toward the future changed pretty significantly with that with with those eye opening experiences with those changes in understanding as you look forward now what what would your dream be of you said you said you don't want to be passive and so you choose to be active in some way what what do you envision? What do you hope to inspire, change, correct, connect? What, what is that dream now? My dream now? Hmm. Well, I mean, simply put, it's just to inspire people to be more curious. I mean, if I had to just reduce it to a soundbite, mm -hmm. I think that most of the suffering that we see in the world today and most of the suffering maybe more significantly that we ignore is a consequence of a lack of curiosity. And that might sound uh, flippant, but I mean, when people look at people that are starving or people that are suffering uh, political persecution, like where, what role does curiosity play in somebody starving? You know, like they, should they be more curious about something? No, it's not necessarily that it's about their need to be more curious. It's about our responsibility to be more curious and, and ask after their welfare. For those of us that have the luxury of time um, and that have the luxury uh, or the privilege of resources to inquire after and even support people um, who are suffering and, and not doing that is a moral failing. But it has to start from a place of wanting to know more about the world around you. You don't magically come to the conclusion that, oh, wait, people in X country are suffering. No, you need to engage. You need to start on a path of inquiry, not knowing necessarily where you're going to wind up. And that can be frightening to people. It can feel like an inconvenience. Um, and this is why soundbite culture is so appealing. You know, you can get your daily dose of outrage and also reassurance that, like, you're okay in the world, just being upset and apathetic because there's not much that can be done to change things. Um, but once you start questioning those narratives and asking like two or three or four extra questions that aren't being addressed in your nightly newscast, you start to realize, okay, understanding this issue is actually going to take some effort on my part. And a lot of people quit at that point. But when you do that, you're not just quitting on learning what the facts are. You're refusing to acknowledge um, the reality of other people who might be living with the consequences of like your tax dollars, your government's like political policies. And that to me is, yeah, it's, it's not something that we can, it's not a responsibility that we can walk away from, especially as Americans. I resonate strongly with the challenge to be more curious. One of the things that I discuss with so many, not, although not often in a political context, so I appreciate the calibration is that, the truth is typically four to six levels deep and most people only ask the first one or two. 
uh, whether that's in as simple of a situation as how are you doing or how are you feeling or whether it's in something far more complex like what you're mm-hmm. like what you're discussing so I, I that challenge resonates with with me for sure what as a result of your curiosity what is it that you're now doing what actions are you taking or what it, it, we we talked about the the business that you're running and the podcast that you're doing what what is your day to day as you look to help create these changes or encourage people to be more curious? So the short and unromantic answer to that question is probably the same answer you'd get from a lot of people if they're being honest. And that is, I'm trying to figure out a way to make it sustainable, man. I'm trying to figure out a way to like, to, uh, to fund what I'm doing. Uh, because it's not, I mean, I'm doing nonprofit humanitarian media projects you know, that's not something that people are lining up to throw cash at. <laughs> even, in the, even amongst those who are of a humanitarian mindset, it's kind of toward the bottom of the list of priorities for some reasons that are on the surface pretty understandable. Namely, if I'm going to give for humanitarian reasons, then I want to fund hospitals, I want to fund education and food relief, right? But you're addressing those are the, the basic symptoms, human needs. right? What's that? Those is, are is symptoms, the, exactly. Yeah, the challenge and what I'm that, trying to address and the difficulty... Uh, and the challenge of making my pitch is that those things are going to continue to be recurring problems so long as you don't educate yourself and the general public about the root causes of these problems and, and give them the basic information and tools that they need to start addressing those root causes so that you know, we're not constantly responding to crises. And it's ultimately cheaper. If people make a pass policy um, and engage in uh, relationships in the international arena that are informed by facts you know, rather than responding to crises if they all happen in a vacuum. So as far as what my dream is, I mean, it's, was that your question? Was that your last question? <laughs> or did we already do the dream but, one? I, uh, we, what is my business? What is my business? There you go. Yeah. So my business, well, there's two things that I've got going on. There's the podcast, which I'd love to turn into something that's economically viable. Um, and then there's also the nonprofit, which has been going on since 2015. And the project behind it, the virtual dinner guest project has been going on since 2011. That project, the virtual dinner guest project, which is part of Open Roads Media, um, that is a project that connects people from around the world to have conversations online over a meal. But the idea is to connect people who come from countries that are in political or cultural conflict with one another or where there's grounds to make appeals to solidarity, you know, where they're going through a similar set of challenges and they can learn from how each side is responding to them. At the end of those dinner conversations, typically between students, we exchange questions and both teams of dinner guests on either side take their respective questions to the street of their community and they have two weeks to make a short film that answers the question they've been given by the other country. So like when I connected India and Pakistan, the Pakistani side in Islamabad gave all of our students in India this question at the end of sharing a meal together. And we ran around Bangalore for like a week asking people this question that we got from Pakistan. While the Pakistanis did the same thing with this question from India. These are two countries with like a history of like nasty wars. Uh, decolonization ended in, in uh, the colonial period ended in a really ugly way and they've got nuclear weapons. Like there's some serious issues they need to work through and promoting dialogue and, and hearing from the street instead of just from pundits on the equivalent of Fox News in India, which is everywhere, is really important. And as far as the podcast... So my idea with that is to well, essentially- let's yeah, say so let's pause there for a second. This, this this dinner guest project is a big part of what most fascinated me when you and I began talking, and mm-hmm. it, it seems so powerful and so simple in some ways in terms of the idea, but I'm I'm assuming somewhat complex in terms of orchestrating to get two parties that are on opposite sides, maybe bitter opposite sides of any particular conflict, issue, disagreement. We see what happens just when we try and join them on Facebook, but you're putting them at a virtual dinner table, having them eat dinner, look and talk to each other, and then explore that further. How hard is that to make happen? Well, I mean, the part that you're pointing out are probably not the... They're not, they're not the most difficult parts. It's not the ideology 
or the ideological differences that make it difficult to connect people. And I understand why you would assume that it's an assumption that a lot of people make. Like, of course, the fact that these people maybe hate each other, that's going to be the biggest barrier to bringing together in a room, right? Of course. Well, that might be true on the more general social scale when you're talking about country to country or like uh, or political policies. But in any country or in any conflict scenario, you can find people who are amenable to contact, right? So I find those people. So my challenge actually is a different one. And it's, well, if I've got these people who more or less kind of already see eye to eye, how are they representing the conflict? <laughs> right? Got it. That's one challenge. And then the other challenge is like, if, if they just agree, if you just, in other words, bring a bunch of like liberals around the table on both sides and they all just agree that, well, the people on the right are the problem in both of their countries, <laughs> you haven't really represented authentically what the stakeholders are in that conflict. So the way that I address that is with the film. The way that I address that is saying, look, like it might be that everyone here today is of at least an amenable enough mindset to give their free time, sit down and have a conversation, not scream at each other, right? Maybe you do or don't represent the general public, <laughs> you know, in that respect. But here's what we're gonna represent the general public. When you're done with this and you receive your question, you're going to go interview the general public. That's who we're gonna actually hear from. And so in that way, I take people who might be kind of on the liberal end of the political spectrum and I say, this isn't about showcasing your point of view. You know, you have 90 minutes to do that in your conversation together but this is about showcasing what the broader public has to say. And I want you to be earnest in your efforts to go out and take an authentic cross section of your communities, to represent points of view that you don't necessarily agree with. So that's how I address like, the ideological friction. As far as the, the logistics and the other kinds of challenges that come with trying to put these things together, yeah, it's, logistics is a part of it. Like we're dealing a lot of times with countries that don't have great infrastructure, that's a challenge. Um, in the first few years that I was doing this, I was still figuring out my methodology as I went. I was just, I very much decided I was just going to figure out what this project was even in the laboratory of real life and just learn by failing over and over again. Like, okay, people aren't responding well to things when I do it this way. You know, people want more of this. They don't want that. Um, I need to let this be as much as possible a participant driven project and to allow them to take ownership of the process as much as possible. So, but there need to be certain rules so that it's not just chaos. So I kind of learned how to refine it. But at the end of the day, I think that what I've come up with, along with like feedback from hundreds of people, is a methodology that can be dropped into just about any cultural context and work. The, the challenging part is finding institutional partners that will like give up their classroom time to do this, you know, having professors or department heads or universities that will integrate this into their school curriculum, which is what I want to do literally everywhere. I want this to just be something that you experience as a college student in any university in the world. That's my ambition. And the other challenge is, again, financing. It's not easy to find people who will fund stuff like this because they don't necessarily get how all the moving parts fit together. What are you currently doing with the videos when you get them? So when we first are done shooting these, we, we do all of the interviews in the local language, first of all. And that's to make sure that we're not excluding people from participation based on like their language proficiency in English, because that wouldn't be accurate or fair. So we post them online when we're done. And the idea is that you then take these small, intimate conversations between five to 10 people on each side of this virtual dinner table. And we convert them into content that the general public can benefit from and be educated by. So you take people who've had this small scale encounter and then you task them with a creative collaboration that can then educate the global public. So we just post them online. And are they, the are they translated when they're posted online or no? They're subtitled in English. Yeah. Okay. And if and I had more resources, I'd do more subtitling in more languages, but that's, that's hard to do. Right. Well, step by step, right? Yeah. I, and when you, when you actually, I guess we'll call it out here and we'll put it in the show notes. Where can they, where can our audience find those videos online? Openroadsmedia.org. Perfect. We'll, Openroads with an S plural media.org. Perfect. And we'll link to that in the show notes for, for sure. I'm, I'm confident that a number of our audience members are going to want to go look at those. I know when we first met, I went and looked as well. It, when you, when you think of these videos, are there, has there been anything particularly powerful that has struck you about either the process or the results of the videos themselves? 
Yeah, that I can answer pretty clearly and hopefully succinctly. So it's the video is its own thing, right? You can watch those, your listeners can watch those and they'll get whatever they want to from them. I'm not going to give a spoiler. You know, I don't mm -hmm. know that any of these are Oscar contenders. Like the, the pretty basic um, as far as their production value, but we do the best we can with volunteers or with limited resources. I'm proud of the last one that we did. And I think part of why the production value looks a little bit better is we actually got some funding to pay professional camera people. Um, and it really shows. Uh, I mean, that's just one thing that I've learned is if you want people to engage with your stuff, it needs to look the part. You know, it doesn't necessarily matter where that your heart's in the right place. It needs to be something people will click on. So that's just a, a harsh reality to learn about trying to do humanitarian media projects. Um, one of the things that I've learned is beyond the videos, like on kind of a more meta level, like it's the process of making these things that connects people. And I'm talking about the participants in the project. So it's not that the general public's going to get this benefit from the videos, but the people who go through this whole process of like, exchanging news articles with people in another country, sitting down and having this dinner conversation with them, taking their question to the street, um, making these films and feeling awkward because very few of the participants have done this documentary street film projects before, Come, getting over like their anxieties. And then by the end of the day, you start to see them feeling more confident and transformed. And also their eyes, like a lot of times are just like lit up because they're seeing their own communities in a way that they never have before. They're engaging with them in a way that they never have before. And they're losing their fear of people whom they typically don't interact with anymore. And that's like a beautiful thing to watch. And then at the end of it, uh, when the films are all done and edited, we come back and we do another dinner. And one of the things that I've noticed consistently is the the tone of familiarity in that second encounter between these people at the second virtual dinner is radically different than it is in the first one. Hmm. And, I, and I couldn't really put my finger on like why that was for a while. Cause I'm like, I don't get it. Like they haven't really talked to each other much, you know, like we just we broke like from our huddle after that first dinner and then people went their separate ways for two weeks. Like why are they seeming to interact like long lost friends? And at a certain point it just started to click. It's like, because they shared an ordeal together. Even if they haven't been in the same physical space with one another, they know through their own experience, like they, they have something they can relate to the other side because they know, they might not have seen their anxiety, they might not have seen what they've been through, but they can assume that it approximates their own experience of making these films. And they have something, like they have a common experience they can now talk about. Their connection isn't theoretical, it isn't about politics, it isn't about navigating cultural differences, it's, you had to go do what I did. That was a pain in the ass. That was kind of difficult and confusing at times. And I learned some things about myself. Did you learn those things? Was it difficult in the same way for you? And it becomes much more personal. Is, do you think the dynamic is the same? The, the curiosity that we dig into these issues, even from being 10, 000 or 8,000 miles away, digging into an issue and asking questions and being motivated to action, is, is what you're doing basically the, the same thing just on a, on a tighter scale of two people. I mean, if, if what you're asking is like, is are people who are involved in a parallel inquiry? Cause that's kind of what's going on here, right? Mm -hmm. You have people in two different cultural contexts, but they're both charged with asking a question, right? So there, so there is both curiosity, right? Like they're stewards of somebody else's curiosity in a sense, or like right. diplomats for their curiosity. So there's that element to it. Like in, in that sense, there's the curiosity component. And then there's the experiential portion of this too, which is you can't engage in this inquiry in a library. You can't do this in, on the internet. You need to get your butt out on the street and you don't know what you're going to get coming back at you when you ask these questions, including right. people saying, get away from me with your camera, you know, <laughs> or in some cases, the police intervening in, in places where like they're not terribly friendly to media and they don't know what to make of you. So all of those things like form a part of the whole where it, steps away from in that initial dinner encounter being this kind of at best like camaraderie through a shared intellectual pursuit you know you haven't really done anything together other than just talk about some issues to mm, you come back after that second or you come back to that second dinner after having gone to the streets and it's like no we had to go out and like put our money where our mouth is and we didn't know what we were going to get coming back at us and there's the sense of accomplishment hopefully not trauma, that hasn't happened yet, um, that comes with having put yourself out there. And then the curiosity takes on a different uh, tone. It's, I wonder if they went through what I went through. You know, I wonder if like, 
if they had the same challenges and the same anxieties and the same fears. And I wonder how they addressed them. And I wonder if they came through the other side the way that we did, or I wonder if they suffered the same disappointments that we have. And your questions become like just naturally they migrate toward a more personal place because what you're feeling out on the street is like, it's not an intellectual exercise purely. It's an emotional one. It's, it's like part of how you win people's trust very quickly trying to do street interviews with them. It's an empathetic exercise. You need to win people's trust. You don't just do that by charging up to them and screaming a question in their face. You need to be somehow relatable and expose some vulnerability to them, right? So you're learning something about yourself, ideally. And that's something that's, that's something that then serves your relationship with these people 10,000 miles away or wherever they are on the other side of the planet. You know, did they make themselves vulnerable in the same way? Can we now talk about our shared sense of vulnerability in this process, even though they were in a different country when they were doing it? Um, so yeah, I think that it absolutely, like it adds a whole nother dimension to the conversations and it's how you build, I think, not just in my project, but just in life. It's like, it's how you build substantive human relationships with people, you know? And is, is that, are those relationships what led you to your podcast? Nice segue, buddy. <laughs> well done. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, I mean, what led me to my podcast was burnout, to be honest. And that might sound kind of crazy. because It's like a podcast for anybody who's gone on that journey. And I know you're well into yours. Like, it's work, man. Like the idea that like a podcast would be a refuge from burnout might seem a little bit crazy, but um, I had been pretty beaten around like over the years, like 2011 to 2017, like six years, most of that, like by myself on the road in really challenging environments, like politically, economically, socially, environmentally, like places that were really polluted and my body had just taken a beating. And in 2017, I decided I needed to take a break for a while because I was starting to lose my enthusiasm for what I was doing. And uh, yeah, so I did. And in that moment is when I decided, all right, well, if I'm going to have this time, I, I still love connecting with people. I still love learning for its own sake. I can't imagine just not doing anything with that impulse. So that's where the podcast came from. It was, all right, here's a way where with basically no money, um, and with much greater frequency, like I can do these podcasts ideally every week. I try to stick to that, but it's been challenging. Um, I can do these podcasts every week, whereas it takes me like months and months of planning and asking for money and all of this stuff to pull off one of those projects. You know, I, I like to think that in the future I can increase the frequency of those dinner guest events, but it's difficult, especially when you're bringing in like international, you're bringing in film crews on two different sides. Like it's insane logistically. So a podcast is more simple. It's not that it's not work, it's a lot of work, but it's just me needing to convince somebody to talk to me for an hour. You know, that's a little bit different. Like the scale is completely different. <laughs> and also the other reason that I pursued it was, I learned very early on in doing these virtual dinner guest project events that this was not going to be a platform for me to showcase my opinion. And I've got opinions, <laughs> strong ones. So. When I had that realization, I, I mean, I, I, I think I've stayed pretty faithful to that because there's just no real way for people to trust you or to see the credibility of a platform for dialogue if they think that the guy behind it is just trying to use it to like censor other people's opinions and showcase their own. It's just not going to work. You know, it really, for it to be viable, for me to get the access that I have to people's communities on the street, because the participants are the ones that are taking me into their refugee camps and to other places. They're not going to take me to those places if they think this is about, this is an ego project for me, or I'm just showing up as some like a Western savior. Um, it needs to be led by the participants. So that said, um, I have strong opinions after several years of traveling around the Middle East, South Asia, the US, Mexico border, all these places, and I want to share them. So that's where the podcast came in as well. So it was a convergence of different like needs and interests. It was, okay, I want to continue to do something that involves connections and educating the public and educating myself. Um, it needs to be something that I can do frequently and without many financial resources. And, uh, and also I'd like to be able to, you know, stand on my soapbox a little bit more and say what I really think about some of the things that I've seen over the years while not making the show only about myself either. You know, I try to strike that balance. And uh, 
I welcome feedback in that regard if people think that I've strayed too far in one direction. And that's the Latitude Adjustment Podcast, which we will also link to in the show notes. A lot of compelling content and certainly some strong opinions being expressed. As you look back at all of these things that you've already done, and it's easy to look forward at all the things that you would like to inspire and that, that you would still like to do. But as you look back, is there something that you would claim as your defining moment on this journey? Is it that moment that you went to the Middle East? Is it something else? Um, I think there hasn't been just one. I think that I might be in one now that I'll look back on in 20 years and realize this is it, you know, these months, <laughs> you know, it's, it's hard to know when you're in one, but uh, I think that it's been, I mean, this is a cliche thing to say, but it's been like a journey, you know, it's been a process. So it's hard to say exactly where you're at when you're in the middle of that. And when it's a lifelong pursuit, I'll have more clarity about what, where I'm at now later. But yeah, that first decision to, to go to the Middle East in 2002 was definitely a big one. That's the thing that kind of just where reality just came crashing in. Like I, it wasn't an option to just insist that my opinion was correct when confronted with like my waking reality, walking out of the street just told me different. Then there was going to Israel and Palestine as a graduate student, some, some similar uh, realizations. And then there was my decision to basically buy a one-way ticket to Beirut in 2012 and try and crowdfund this project after I arrived. Like that was maybe the scariest you thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> so, and the idea behind like doing it after I arrived was so that people would take me seriously. Because anybody can say I've got this crazy idea, which my ideas typically are. And I don't say that in like a self-flattering kind of way. Like I routinely question my sanity and the, <laughs> the lack of financial success reaffirms that question. You know, was this a good idea? I don't know. But but in any case, I just felt this need, like I needed to get back to the Middle East while events were happening with the Egyptian revolution and other places. And Syria had just kind of started back then. So I thought the world needs this right now. There's an opportunity for Americans and people in the West to have a very different kind of relationship with the Middle East if we can eliminate the middleman, which is basically all the political interests and money, and just have direct conversations amongst the citizens, citizen to citizen diplomacy. So I need to take the first step and I need to have enough faith in myself to think that I can get myself there and that the world will essentially catch me before I fall on my face. Um, I've fallen on my face plenty of times in the process, but, but there's, I have to say, like, I've, I've managed to hang on by my fingernails because people have let me sleep on their couches, their spare rooms, have fed me, have passed me on to their friends in like the next town, the next village, the next country, like all along this, this route. And that's been, if anything, I mean, I become cynical in some ways about how aid works, how these kinds of projects even get funded and the nepotism and, the, and uh, how the odds are just stacked against you and the politics that are involved. But what's reaffirmed my faith in humanity is the fact that people have believed in what I'm doing. It's sometimes when I've questioned it and enough to provide me with like a hot meal and a place to sleep, you know, just because they dug the idea. And people have told me, look, like, I don't really have anything that I can give to you. I can't donate to your campaign. Um, but if you want to stay here, you can for as long as you need to or for a few days. Or when you go on to the next country, I've got my cousin lives in that village. In this, in this village. I've had that happen, man, more times than I can even count. You've given so much to the journey, and it sounds that the journey in its, in its own way has given back to you, maybe not directly financially in all of those, but in the, in the connections, the understandings, the people, the, the, the growing confidence in the breadth of humanity, if not the, if not the specifics of it. When you consider the different things that that you've learned and you've shared several already. Are, is there a lesson that stands out that you say, man, I, I, I learned this and this would be helpful for other people to know as they embark upon their journeys? Don't wait for the right moment. <laughs> there isn't one, you know, like, um, and either that will make sense to you as you hear this or it won't. You know, I, I think that I'll ruin it if I try and provide any more definition to that. Don't wait for the right moment. If there's something that's like 
burning in your heart to go out and, and add to the world or experience, do it. Don't wait till you got the money. Don't wait till you feel that you know enough. Just do it. Simple is good and simple is often powerful. Is there something that you know now that you wish you'd known when you started? I mean, if I say no to that, then it's like, no, I haven't learned anything. I've just... <laughs> I don't think I that's, I don't think that that's what that means opinions. at all, right? <laughs> there are a lot of different perspectives on that question. Uh, is there something that I wish I'd known when I started? I mean, I, I might tweak that and just say that if I had known what I know now when I started, I don't know if I would have done it. <laughs> and I think you probably will hear that from a lot of your guests. I, I have, like, if I knew it was going to be this freaking hard, if I knew that like people were just going to come after me and try and destroy my reputation for just trying to do the right thing, you know, Yeah. because like some American guy with a free speech project just isn't so welcome in some parts of the world, it turns out. <laughs> so like sometimes the veil that, of ignorance is a blessing, right? <laughs> absolutely, man. Um, and I think that uh, my naivete has, I don't know if it's served me well, but it's served me to wherever I'm at. If you think about a, a lot of the members of our audience who may be new entrepreneurs or who may be beginning their journey as a, a and thinking about becoming an entrepreneur, is there a characteristic that you would say is maybe the most important or one of the most important things that, that they've got to have if they're going to succeed? I mean, I struggle with the whole notion of whether or not I even fit the mold of entrepreneur. I don't know. That's fair. How, but, well, where do you say, where do you think you fit on that spectrum? Um, I don't know, man. <laughs> to be totally honest, like, it kind of goes back to that question of like, what was your first dream or whatever when you were a kid? Right. It's like, I, I haven't thought about, I need to claim that mantle. I think some people want to be an entrepreneur so they can be called an entrepreneur, <laughs> right? You know, like that's their thing. They just want to be able to have the title. And for me, I'm like, I don't know if I am one or not. It's not really important to me what I call myself um, unless it's helpful in, well, making my appeal for support or well, for, uh, for winning people's trust. Then, then let's reframe the question in, in your, in your journey in pursuing the, the, the mission and the goals that you've been on, if someone were to want to go and pursue their, their journey and their journey is going to vary from yours, but is there, is there a characteristic that you think makes it more likely for them to succeed? I mean, everybody's going to bring their own talent to what they do. Right. And so in some ways, I have to, and I appreciate your question, but I have to answer it blindly in that sense. Like I'm not gonna know who's listening to this right now and what their particular talents might be. And so not knowing that, just making a general message to people, I mean, I'd reflect on my lack of talent and my uh, middling intellect <laughs> and just say that like, if I've got one asset that I think has served me well, it's that I'm freaking tenacious. Like I just don't quit and to a fault. And I think that that's probably true of people who are highly successful. And it's probably true of a lot of people who aren't and just uh, are casualties along the road to success. And it remains to be seen which one of those categories I'm in yet. You know, if I'm being honest with myself, but um, you also need to be careful, like with so many things, like your strengths can become your weaknesses too. And I've seen this tendency in myself to just like not know when to walk away from certain ways of doing things, not knowing when to walk away from something that just isn't viable because I'm not a quitter. You know, like that's just like the mantra that I have in my head. Like I'm not a quitter. Sometimes like the, sometimes it's prudent to change course. And there's a difference between being a quitter and pivoting as I guess they say in like um, entrepreneurial lingo, right? Like sometimes you need to, rec to listen to other people's advice and, and sometimes you need to ignore it too. There's been plenty of people that have laughed in my face when I told them what I do for a living. You know, you've asked me how do I describe what I do? Well, in my many attempts to do it, I've often been laughed at and learned to develop a thick skin and just recognize that some people just aren't gonna get it. And Maybe when I'm being laughed at, there's also something there, you know, like take on board the criticisms that might be valid and develop a filter for the stuff that isn't. So have a thick skin, be tenacious and um, be humble. 
you know, like for me, I can't conceive of doing something that's really just about the pursuit of material fi or financial rewards. I can't do it. Um, which isn't to say that like I'm some like holier than that person and I don't care about being comfortable. I do, but I just don't think it would sustain me, you know? So I think that if you pursue something that's bigger than yourself, you will always have that as reassurance, you know, through like difficult moments that look like there, there is something of value that's not just about my bank account that I'm pursuing here. And also you'll find that you end up being surrounded by a different sort of people. A lot of really good thoughts packed into that answer for, for a question that it, that it took a moment to reframe. I think you, you gave us like five things that are super helpful and that everyone would do well to maybe rewind the podcast about three minutes and listen to again to unpack. I, I greatly appreciate that. As you, it, you think about all of those things that, that you've just called out and you've talked so much about the challenges of the journey. And there are many, I, I can attest to that in my, in my own journey. Are there any particular resources that have made it easier or that, that smoothed the way other than maybe the, the people that you've encountered in the different countries? Resources. Um, Tools, I mean, books, anything. Yeah. I mean, I probably should have read more books on how to be a business person. <laughs> so maybe, <laughs> maybe you can throw some resources at me. Maybe I should be listening to your show. You know? um, so yeah, as far as like having any astute insights into like how to develop your business acumen, those are areas where I'd say I've got a lot more work to put in. I'm, I'm always, I get wrapped up and carried away with the creative side of what I do and the like developing the business sense has always been like pulling teeth to me, which I suspect isn't the case for you. You know, like that's probably you're like a duck to water, but I'm, I struggle with that stuff and with the self-discipline that it takes to achieve those skills. This is why I work with creatives. This is why creatives are the creatives and entrepreneurs, but creatives in, in general are the largest part of my audience. <laughs> there you go. All right. <laughs> well, um, so as far as, what was the question again now? <laughs> the resource, if you had any resources that you might recommend. Uh, if you don't, that's cool, man. I mean, my resources really are just people. And I mean, I guess at the end of the day, that's all many of us really have, you know, like they say in, I mean, in just cold, hard business sense too, like you're selling, not the thing you're selling yourself, right? That's true. in what I'm doing too. You know, if I, I could have the best idea in the world. I could have an idea that's supposed to help a lot of people and they really deserve to be supported. And people won't support that idea if I'm an asshole. You know, if I come across as somebody who's arrogant and like has an idea that just that deserves support instead of having to make the case for it, um, I'm not going to get it. And that's been a humbling realization too, you know, because there have definitely been moments where I'm like, why isn't this getting support? Like it, like I'm getting all kinds of validation from the people who are doing it, that this is something that they love. And it's cause I gotta do my work, man. Like it's, first of all, make sure you're being humble. Second of all, make sure you're putting in the work to be able to be your own best advocate. Having a great idea is one thing, having the ability to articulate it and pitch it to people effectively. That's a different set of, uh, of skills. As we begin to wrap up the first section here of our conversation, what, what would you say if someone uses this phrase, dreams are real, what, what does that mean to you? Is it something that, that feels tangible, that feels real? What, what meaning does that hold for you? I mean, I do think that I'm not a particularly touchy feely like spiritually oriented guy. I, I mean, um, I, I, I was at one point in my life and not so much anymore. Um, but that said, I do think that we manifest like our reality in a lot of ways. We manifest our opportunities by the way we show up in life. And so in that sense, like if you don't allow yourself to conceive of the things that you want in life is actually being possible. You know, if they're just daydreams, 
and not dreams that you will allow uh, like the possibility to actually come to fruition um they're not going to happen so in that sense like there's are dreams real yeah because you make them right. <laughs> you know no that makes um, sense like, yeah there's that there's there's it's not as simple as just again having a good idea uh or um or being a romantic like you got to put in the work that's a a common theme through our discussion today when others and and i will definitely include myself in this because i i would make this statement about you even if you might not about yourself when others say to you that you are an example that dreams are real that that you even though you're in the middle of your journey you are proof to many others that that dreams really are real how does that make you feel people can say whatever they want <laughs> Well, you said you weren't that touchy feely. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I mean, and I'm not trying to be difficult. I just say that <laughs> I didn't think you were. Yeah, I mean, people can say what they want, and that's part of my bag too, man. I'm about free speech, so say what you want. You know, say what, say that's what how you people want. want to make sense of uh, of a life that, in some ways, still doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> that's fine. Um, but uh, I'm, I mean, I'm trying to just get comfortable with like uh, where I'm at in the ride. I think that that's fair. And I, I, I guess I would say it maybe differently in a way that, that could be a little more palatable to you, which is that I and others that I know find even your current spot in the journey quite inspirational. And we, we appreciate what you're doing. As we, as we take a step forward, we move to our fortunate five, to questions that are five questions that we ask all of our guests that share a little bit of maybe some fortunate things you've done, some fortunate things you could do, and even a, a broader look at the world. First of those is what is the most exciting or adventurous thing you've ever done? And man, you have a list that you've given us already today. So I'm very curious to hear which one you'll, you'll choose for the answer to this. Um, well, to spare you another long answer um, in your audience, I would just say it's, it's the next thing. You know, the most exciting thing I've done is usually the next set of challenges that I've chosen for myself. And at this stage, that looks like it's going to be a book. Ooh, that is so adventurous. Nice. I'm terrified, man. I, I'm, I'm trying to, I mean, I'm thinking about it every day and what it's going to take to write something that I think people will connect with is going to involve me exposing more vulnerability more publicly than I've ever done in my life. And Otherwise, I just can't see it connecting with people. I've tried to figure out, well, I could just leave this part out and like people don't need to know this. I just don't, that, then there'll be a big hole in my journey. Well, why would you make that decision? You know, like it, you got to tell the story for people to connect with the story with all of its like, uh, with all of your human frailties and faults. So that's terrifying. And I'm excited about where that might lead to because I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm tired of boring people with like anecdotes. <laughs> I want people to kind of be able to maybe sit down at their at their own pace, like try and make sense of of my life and, and and maybe make sense of it in different ways than I have, and just see what happens when I put that out into the world and see how people respond to it. You know, like there'll be that will be a learning process for me too. It's not just like here's what I've learned and blessing blessing the world with. It's like here's what I'm still confused by in written form. <laughs> how does the world respond to this, and what can I learn from that? I've been told write a book when you can't not write a book, and it sounds like you're pretty close to yeah, that. Yeah, man, it gets, I've almost this, like I, I would describe it almost like, like it's gonna burst out of me like that alien, you know, <laughs> if I don't do some sort of like surgical intervention. If it does, like, get get that it. on video, man. <laughs> What's that? I said if it bursts out of you like an alien, at least get the video. That'll that'll totally, man. We'll post yeah. that up there. What, uh, what's something that you wish you were good at, but aren't yet? Hmm. There's a long list there, man. Um, <laughs> yeah, me too. Uh, I wish I devoted more time to musical pursuits. I wish that I devoted more time to, and when I say wish, it's not like, oh, poor me. No, I mean, I wish I'd done that in the past and I intend to do these things in the future. Um, so music, languages. I flirted with quite a few languages and I just haven't drilled down 
one yet. You know, I can get around in Arabic. Um, getting there with Spanish. But, uh, but yeah, I need to devote more time. And I don't have a natural aptitude for languages either, which makes it like more of like a grind. I don't either. It's frustrating. I have, I have studied four other languages and I, I, I just revert back to trying to get better at English, I think. But <laughs> because I struggle with the... Which is a worthwhile pursuit too, man. <laughs> you know? Do you have, is there one language that if you, say, if you were to say, I, that's the one I want to be good at if i could pick one that i was magically better at right now it would be that i could pick two easily okay um one right now just because of where i'm living spanish is like a no-brainer you know like it's it's what i'm surrounded by but i also want to get back out to the middle east again and as i'm learning spanish i'm noticing that my arabic is fading okay. significantly and it was never great i don't want to pretend like i was ever fluent never, not even close but yeah those two arabic and spanish and when you think about like how many different countries speak those languages, it just opens up a huge part of the world for you. Right. Any particular musical instrument? You mentioned music as well. Any, any instrument you, you long for? I mean, I think because I travel so much, the thing that I'll probably pick up first is just the harmonica, man. Nice. You, know, you can jam with people anywhere and it fits in your back pocket. Um, if I was ever going to be stationary long enough, I'd probably like mess around with a guitar. Fun. What is the best, and, and this will be interesting because you have this whole dinner experience. What's the best meal or food experience that you've ever had? Also difficult. So I'll just go with the first cool one that comes into my head. There's, I don't know if you or your guests are familiar with the Uyghur community. These are like uh, Chinese Muslims. Okay. And they're being persecuted heavily right now in, in China as well, um, like put in concentration camps from what we're gathering. It's really difficult to actually get um, press about what's happening to them out of China. But it's like it's grim, man. Um, so they've a lot of them have scattered to different countries around the world, as has Chinese di diaspora, more generally speaking. And given that they're Muslims, they've wound up a lot of times in, in Muslim majority countries. So there's a sizable Uyghur community or at least anecdotally from what I've seen, there's a, there's a Uyghur community in Cairo. So you have Chinese Muslims in, uh, in the Middle East. And uh, there's like this restaurant in this just working class neighborhood in Cairo that like no tourist would ever know about or bother going to. This Uyghur food, Chinese Muslim food. Um, I don't know where the religion plays into that, but I mean, they're also a distinct kind of cultural culture too like they're from from i think xinjiang province in, in western china so it's just i mean it's different different culture um they have this restaurant in like this blue collar neighborhood in cairo where like the functional language is polaroid pictures <laughs> like they, they bring out the menu and you just point to like a polaroid picture of the dish that you want because their arabic isn't terribly strong and obviously the local people aren't speaking chinese and oftentimes, like, you will see some expats who found out about this place. So, like, they're not necessarily speaking either of those languages. So everybody's just pointing at, like, these Polaroid photos of, like, noodle and beef dishes or whatever. And the food is freaking awesome. Like, there's no artifice around it. Like, it's not about the presentation. It's just, like, the food's got to speak for itself. And you're just sitting there on, like, plastic chairs in the middle of, like, um, yeah, again, like working class neighborhoods with like broken down cars and just people living their life and doing the laundry like above your head in the in the, in the apartment block above you. I love it. The experience sounds incredible. I'm hungry for the food. And it reminds me of a a place down the road from our hotel in Kuala Lumpur earlier this year, uh, just in your in your description. And now, now I'm just follow the lines, man. If you don't know what the food's good to see. Don't judge it from like what the outside of the restaurant looks like or like how fancy it looks like. Go to the place with the long line. Yes. What you've traveled so many places already. Do you still have a dream travel destination? Is there somewhere in the world yep, that you haven't that's been? That's easy. Okay. Iran. Iran. Yeah. And what, what draws you there in particular? Um, because it's difficult to get there and because it's, <laughs> because it's also the subject of so much controversy and misunderstanding, particularly in the U S and that's my thing, man, you know, like it right. kind of makes sense that like what I would seek out is the place that like we're told not to go. Right. And that is the big, like mysterious devil. You may be the only one on the podcast that picks Iran as their dream travel destination. And I love it. I, and I look forward to hearing when you go, 
Last of these five, what do you hope or believe will be the most exciting invention of the next 30 years? I think that, I mean, I'm not really a tech guy. I use it for what I do, but so I'm not somebody that's got some insight into like what's coming down the pipeline. What I look forward to, I guess, are just refinements of things that we've already got. So what I look forward to is where we can take a project like mine and make it seamless, where it literally feels like your classroom is connected to somebody else's classroom in another country, or it's like a floor to ceiling display, like screen, where it almost feels like you can just reach out and touch somebody in the other side of the room, you know, where it like feels like it's 3D. It's like an Oculus Rift, but the entire, uh, but the entire room. I don't know what that is. Uh, sorry. Is I like, like some of the, some, some of the virtual reality headsets. Okay. But yeah, for, I guess so, man. We're just, it com feels completely immersive, but what you're looking at is, in fact, exists. You know, it's not just augmented reality. It's like right. it's real people. Yeah, I love it. As we finish up our conversation, and I'm so thankful that you've taken the, the time to chat with us, is, is there a certain thought or a message that you'd like to leave with our audience? knowing that it's, it is a worldwide audience and that, that's something that I'm, I'm excited about. We have a pretty significant segment of listeners in Asia and some in Europe, certainly a lot in North America, but growing worldwide. Is there a message that you would like to leave with them? I think that one of the most under-discussed and underrated forms of bravery is the uninhibited pursuit of curiosity. And because if you decide to embark on a path where you are radically open-minded, you will be called everything. <laughs> You'll be called a traitor. You'll be called um, every kind of pariah status <laughs> that can be assigned to someone from a political standpoint or social standpoint at some point or another, because we feel comfortable being certain about where we stand with other people. And if you refuse to, to allow yourself to be pigeonholed, you know, which is, why would you? If you're not sure about the nature of your reality, then how it becomes more difficult to define your place in it too, right? And to reassure other people that you agree with everything that they have to say. Um, so be brave enough to be radically curious, you know? And that's not to say without, some, without any ethical or moral foundation to it, you know? Like, Things like consent and, um, and uh, the principle of first do no harm matter. But really, like, uh, I think that the world will be a better place if more people were willing to go to that place in their heads where they allow themselves to live in, uh, with uncertainty. And then to, like you said earlier, and I think I also mentioned, like ask that second and third and fourth question after the nightly news, you know, why are they so angry? You know, like this thing, this terrible thing happened. Why are they so angry? Or why is their government so corrupt? Yes, it's corrupt. And things never seem to change in that country. Why are they so corrupt? Why don't things seem to change? You know? Be brave enough to be radically curious. I feel like that, that is a message that needs to be spread, not just on this podcast, but around the world in so many ways. And I appreciate you for sharing it. How can our audience find you? What are you working on that they should know about? Where can they look and connect? Sure. So first of all, you can find either of my enterprises uh, online. So the first one is my nonprofit. That's openroadsmedia.org. And that's the hosting institution for the Virtual Dinner Guest Project. Then there's the podcast, which is latitudeadjustmentpod.com. And with the first one, with uh, the Virtual Dinner Guest Project, Open Roads Media, what we're working on next is trying to connect the people of Gaza to the citizens of Flint, Michigan, to talk about access to water. And the idea being that through the frame of talking about water access, clean water access is a human right, we can start to explore other human rights issues and why it is that certain communities seem to have their basic human needs consistently neglected and how that's justified and what types of communities, where are the consistencies between how those communities are being marginalized. Fantastic guys. If, if you haven't yet, just by listening to this, reached out and 
connected to this man, you need to do it. Eric Maddox is a force for positive understanding, change, and certainly curiosity in the world. Thanks for being with us, Eric. I appreciate it. It's been awesome. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us on the Dreams Are Real podcast. If anything we've said has inspired you to dream bigger, live more boldly, or move closer to your ideal life, please reach out and let us know. And also be sure to share this episode with a friend. We would be honored if you would like, subscribe, or leave a review for our show on your favorite podcasting platform. And for more discussion of this episode and all things related to the Dreams Are Real podcast, and to receive your free download of Dan's Defining Your North Star training, please join our Dreams Are Real community on Facebook. Until next time, be amazing and keep crushing it.